So as I mentioned, we've been on a journey over the last five weeks of discovering the Father heart of God. And last week we talked about a story that Jesus told actually to the Pharisees because the Pharisees had been driving people away by all the rules and regulations and extras. And Jesus wanted to set things right. And so one of the, the stories that he told was the story of what is known as the prodigal son. And he tells the story of a son that decided he was going to leave home. And he said, Father, I want my inheritance now, which was outrageous. And the father reluctantly gave him his portion. To want your inheritance while your father was still alive was to say, I wish you were dead. Give me what's mine. Jesus purposefully, if you recall, portrays this son in the worst possible condition. And it's really important to get that. As bad as a son could be put, Jesus put him in that place. And so the son, as Jesus tells the story, he goes off and he's the life of the party and he's spending this and that and he, all of a sudden he's out of money with all his wild living. We're never told what the wild living is, but obviously he's having the time of his life. Then the money runs out, and the friends run out, and all of a sudden he's in need. What am I going to do? And it got so bad that he ended up hiring himself out to feed the pigs, which for this kosher boy was not a, a good thing to be able to do. And then it got even worse when they wouldn't even give him pig food. Now he, the bottom has dropped out. What am I going to do? And he does the unthinkable. He says, you know what? I'm going to go home. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not worthy to be you know, a son anymore, but I have no choice. I'm, I'm going to take the risk. And he goes home. And he discovers a father waiting for him and embracing him and loving him. I know, with the outrageous, and the father throws a party for him. And all of a sudden, the son's, what is happening here? You know, where's the lecture? Well, what have you been doing, son? Or have you sold your oats? Are you done? And there's no cleanup before the party. And he would have smelled like, like pig food. He would have been a mess. But he doesn't ask him to clean up first. And the picture of all this is the message is nobody is beyond God's love. You can't do too much and go too far or you can't come home. But so many people today believe that exactly that, that they've done too much. Don't even think about it. Don't talk to me because there's no way for me because I know what I've done. I know who I am. And Jesus portrays the son in this light and then he comes home and he gets a whole different response. I would have thought perhaps that when, he, when his father came running toward him, I would have gone like this but thinking I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get a whoop in here. But he was okay with it because he's, he's, he's starving to death. He's got nothing. And instead of an angry father that begins to give him the lecture and pointing the finger, he put his arms around him and he kisses his son. It's like, what in the world is going on? Instead of judgment and condemnation, he receives grace and mercy. And I really believe God wants us to be a people that offer grace and mercy. And it's always, it's always undeserved. And the other part of this that I want to, to, to add before we move on is that the picture of the prodigal son is a picture of how we can love people and how we can accept people and meet them where they're at. It's not you got to fix yourselves up, you got to do this, you got to believe this. In, in our church in Colorado, we had a saying that you can belong before you believe. You don't have to believe anything. You, I, we just want you to belong. We want you to be a part. We want you to have a journey. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to believe anything, but just come and be a part. And because we believed, and, and I still believe, and we believe here that Jesus Christ is the one that changes people's lives that I, God uses you and me, but there's got to be a bridge, a, a place where people feel that they can come and not be judged, and not be condemned. And so the whole story of, of the prodigal son is, an, is a turning upside down as the Pharisees are hearing Jesus tell the story. But there's another brother. And I want to talk about the elder brother syndrome that we need to fight off when it comes our way. So in Luke chapter 15 and 25, as the son comes home and the party's starting, the band struck up and every, all this is happening, 
the, the older brother gets wind that the younger boy has come home. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come home. Can you imagine? They're all excited. Hey, your brother's home. How about that? That's what's happening. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. You know, and so obviously the servants have no idea what's going on in, this, in the elder brother's head because he's not happy at all to hear what's going on. He says, what? He's come. He's home after all that he's done? to our family and to our, to our dad, and there's a party, you got to, and you think I'm gonna go in? And that's exactly what's happening. And the older brother says, as Jesus continues the story, the older brother became angry and he refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, and that's really important to catch. Because you think about the dad that welcomed his son that had ran away and squandered you know, his inheritance and he dared to show back up. But now he's got a problem with, the older, with, with his older son. And, um, and so he refused to go. And so his father goes out and he pleads with him, pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look. look I want you to catch the attitude. Look, all these years, I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. What an attitude. He says, you know what? No way. I've been the faithful son. I've done everything my father's ever wanted. I've worked day and night and day and night. I've been obedient. I've done everything possible that I need to do. But his term, I've been slaving for you, is quite revealing. Because you know what it reveals? That the father didn't just lose one son, the prodigal. He lost two sons. One as a runaway, and the second one as a slave. One as a runaway, and the other one as a slave. <clears throat> you know, there are believers today they're still trying to earn God's love. They're trying to work hard and get it all right and work, work, work and do it, do it, do it. And they're so close, but so far, this elder brother was right there. He had everything in his father's house was his that he could partake of. But it wasn't enough. All these years I've been slaving for you. What do I get? What do I get as he's comparing himself? And this son of yours, and that, that's the interesting thing as we, <clears throat> as, we go, as we go on. All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You even gave me a goat. But listen to this. But when this son of yours, not my brother, he disowned his brother. He can't stand it. That he's getting the accolades that the party is for him. But when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Now let's backtrack a little bit. Interesting. So the younger brother hasn't met the older brother. He's just hearing about this in the story. He says, he squandered your property. Tell him the dad this. It's like, you need to get a grip, dad. He has messed us up. He has squandered your property. And then he says, with prostitutes. And he comes home. Nobody spoke a word about prostitutes. When I, when I read that, I was like, what? I was like, you don't know what he squandered. He did some wild, he lost all of his money and he's a mess. But you don't know what he did with his money. Could it be that you were, you're really upset because he's out sinning your sin and he's getting away with it? He's out there doing all the stuff that's in hit the older brother's heart. And then he comes home and it's okay. But it's like, it's like the projection that he's decided that you've been out there with prostitutes, haven't you? Why would you even think that? But that's what comes to his mind. And so the elder brother is furious with the situation and blaming his father as well. And then what, what the father does in this is really important for some of us maybe that have grown up in the church 
or never strayed. Maybe we've grown up and we've walked with Jesus all our life and we've never sowed our oats. We never went out and did stupid things, crazy stuff or, or shameful things, kind of things in our own mind. But what about us? Does God love those that have gone off and done the crazy stuff and comes home? Does he love them more? Well, listen to what the Father says here. I love this. After the son going off, the older, elder son going off with all his attitude, I kind of think of what I would do. It's like, man, you, gotta, you better check your attitude. You don't talk to me that way and your brother and all that kind of stuff. It's, he doesn't do that. He says, my son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. You are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead. He's talking to his son, real life here. You're, his brother, you're, he was dead, he was gone. He's alive again. And he was lost and is found. We talked about last week, when you come to Christ, when you came to Christ, or main, when you do come to Christ, all heaven rejoices and celebrates. And it's not your sin that matters. It's not what you've done that matters. It's not anything that matters. And the picture of the Father's love is one thing, relationship, relationship, relationship. Jesus died on the cross for a relationship, not to come in on board with all the rules and regulations. And here's the one son striving and trying to work hard. And then the Father even says to him, you've got her, you already have my love. Now the question comes, does the, does the um, Father, does he love the, the son that ran away and came back more than the son that, was, that stayed behind and just was emotionally distant. The elder brother was right there, but in some ways he was further away from his father than the son who ran away, or just as far. Because he's out there trying to work and earn his father's love and his father's affirmation. And what he got that day, and what you see in the father says, I don't, I don't just, I love you too. And I've always loved you, and everything I have is yours. I, I love that moment where, he's, where it's both sons are embraced by the Father. And I think when we're thinking about a, a season, and we're praying for a season, where God's going to bring the prodigals home, and he's going to bring people that are way out there and believe in the lie that, that, that they've gone too far, they've done too much, they can't come home. That doesn't mean that God loves those of us that are already here less. But the challenge is, will we rejoice and celebrate with those that come home and come, and come back to us and come toward us. That becomes uh, the challenge and what, what we're called to, to be about. The, the two parables Jesus started off with, the parable of the lost coin. When that coin is found, all oh, heaven stops. There's a celebration. When the lost sheep is found, they leave the 99 for the one celebration is. And the question is, though, can we who are already home, can we rejoice on those with those, with the Father, those that are coming home? Can we join in that celebration? That's why when we talk about somebody coming to Christ, I always like to say, can we, can we celebrate? Can we, give them, can we give them a welcome? Can we re be excited about that? I'm actually struck by this father's incredible love and compassion for his elder son, the one that's all caught up in the rules and, try, and striving and all that stuff. And I think he was brokenhearted, don't you? I think he was like, what do you mean save it for me? Are you kidding? He loved both his sons. Not one more than, than the other. You know, when I'm thinking about this passage, and I typically don't teach this as a standalone, but I really felt we need to zero in because I, I think God wants us to realize that sometimes this elder brother syndrome can sneak in to us in subtle ways. Well, some of the things that we can take away from here from the elder brother, 
he comes across, he's, he thinks he's morally superior. I'm superior because I haven't done the things that you've done. I've, I've been good. I've done this and I've done that. And he positioned himself with a self-righteousness and a comparison that can blind us. Let me tell you something. When we compare ourselves to anybody, it blinds us. When we see ourselves in one light and we see our other people as less than because, they have, they, because we've somehow been morally better or more. You know, there's another thing I've asked people. I wonder how you react to this. I've asked the question, do you think God loves Christians more than non-Christians? We sure act like it. That's certainly not true. It's for God so love the world, not for God so love the church. Now, he does love the church. One of the things we learn about God and we learn about the Father, that he loves more than we love. He loves more than we love. And that's got to be good news because we have a hard time loving ourselves. And part of understanding that it's the comparison that the elder brother was experiencing, he was saying, wait a minute, he's been this and I'm this and this is wrong. And so comparisons and self-righteousness and seeing ourselves as morally superior can blind us. The second takeaway I would, I would offer is the elder brother had a lack of empathy. Lack of empathy. This was his brother that came home and he could care less. This was his brother that came home and he could care less. And again, while the younger brother was physically distant, the elder brother was emotionally distant from from his, from his father. He said, I don't care about him. I only care about me. You know, it shows us something that proximity, brace yourself for this one. Proximity doesn't always mean connection. Proximity doesn't always mean connection. What do I mean by that? You can go to church, you can behave and do all the right things, and your proximity to all the things that are good and, and, and full of life and God's spirit and the rest of it, you can be right next to it and not partake of it. I think that's tragic. That's why John in Revelation talks about losing our first love and coming back to our first love. And some of us, we need to come back and remember where we were when Christ found us. He never thought about what his brother went through. Couldn't say, man, he's a mess. Look at him and all the rest of it. He could care less. He just cares that, wait a minute, I'm not getting what I think I should get. Are you with me? I'm not getting what I think I should be getting from this. He's thirdly had a pride in, in his performance. His identity was in his achievements and hard work. Look at me. I've done this and I've done that. Look at, look at me. And you know what his anger reveals? His anger reveals that he's been working all along for approval rather than out of love. He wasn't doing this out of love for his father. It was, he was doing it out of trying to get his father to love him, but his father already did love him. We do that too. Sometimes I think, we, God, I've been slaving for you. I've done right. I pray. I read my Bible. I've done this and that. And look what's happened in my life. Look at this. And these other people, they get everything. You're blessing them. You ever had those moments? Irritate him. I have. It's like, what about, what about my neighborhood, God? You know, and uh, all of a sudden, God begins to owe us. And sometimes the revelation, my friends, is that we start valuing our performance more than our relationship with God or others. But to God, you are the most important thing to him. His relationship with you is everything. When we stray, when we struggle, and when we're trying, he said, like, Rick, what are you doing? You already have my life. Why are you doing all those things? And there's nothing wrong with wanting to serve God and, 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 and do things for God and do all the things that are good. 
But when we're doing it for God's approval, we've missed it. We do it from approval, as I taught a number of weeks ago, because we have his approval, because he already loves us, because I have everything that I can give my life away. And I can do it with, with gladness and joy, not striving to get ahead of you or get ahead of you or somebody and all the rest of it. And the fourth one is the elder brother was focused on what's fair. You know, that's a dangerous word. It's not fair. You ever said that? It's not fair. Growing up in a family, you know, with your siblings, you ever had that? It's not fair. You're not, you ever said all that kind of stuff. You think Jesus dying on the cross is fair? Is it fair that he had to stand in our place and sacrifice his life? And he was perfect and, and we're not? Was that fair? That God had to send his one and only son to it? That ended up on a cross? Demanding, in this case, that his father would recognize his work? I want you to hear this. The father in the story is focused on on his mercy for that son of his. And he prior to, pri, prioritized restoration and relationship above everything else. That's why when the son came home, he's given a speech. You know, I've sinned against heaven and earth. I've sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be your son. He's focused, my sin, my sin, my sin. And all the father could see was my son, my son, my son. And they missed each other. And you can miss God when you relate to God based upon your sin or lack of. Let me say that one again. When we approach or relate to God by our sin or lack of sin, and that's the basis that we come, we have missed it. Like that son missed it coming home. I don't even think if he just opened his eyes, lift up your head, it's not what you thought it was going to be. He loves you. You're his son, and he's not going to have you as a servant. So many Christians that were willing to live in the servant's quarters, and rather, and God's not going to have it. You don't live, and I don't live in the servant's quarters. We live in his house. We belong to him. We're sons and daughters. We're not the extras. We're not just the, we're not just the servant. Even Jesus with, with the disciples, he said, I no longer call you servants. What do you say? I call you my friends. Yeah, you serve me. Yeah, you're my disciples. But you're my friend. You're part of me. Wow. And then the last takeaway. The elder brother doesn't understand grace. I don't know why Christians too often are afraid of grace. Because we think that if we give people grace that we somehow give people a license to sin and do, you know, go on and do whatever. And Paul talked about about that. And sometimes we're afraid of it. We're afraid of that if we tell people that God forgives them, whether they go through things in their life or divorce or what stuff, that it's like there's grace, there's mercy. It's like, um, and by the way, without it, we're all, we're all toast. You know that. We're, we're, we're all toast. He's upset that the father celebrates. Here, here it is, that the the younger son's, he celebrates the younger son's return without making him pay for his mistakes. That's what got him. Make him pay. Don't, don't, act, don't act like it's nothing. By the way, there's consequences for sin. And people have suffered a long time for sins that they've made in their past. And you can be forgiven and restored and have a new life, but sometimes those things that we've done in the past haunt us and we have to carry them but we don't carry them as unforgiving or unforgiven sons and daughters because that's not, that's not the reality. But that son would basically say, you celebrate, make him pay. Give him a lecture, clean him up, do something. You can't let him get away with it. He can't go do all that and come back here and get it all. The father said, yeah, yeah, I can. He can come down and get it all. And that should make us, there should be a joy that comes to our face. It's a reminder, my friends, that grace is countercultural. It's, it's 
goes against the grain. Uh, you see, it's not about earning or deserving anything because we don't, we don't deserve it. By the way, let me give you the, maybe the worst prayer ever. You might want to write this down. It, there, there might be worse. But I think the worst prayer might be, God, give me what I deserve. When you pray that one, I want to take a couple steps back. Because I don't know what's going to come out after that. Would to God that you don't get what you deserve. And I don't get what I deserve. God does not give us what we deserve. His mercy isn't because we deserve something or anything. We get his mercy because we need it. And when we think about showing mercy, we don't show mercy to somebody or forgiveness to somebody because they deserve it. If you wait for some, you to forgive somebody or to show mercy to somebody until they've earned it, until they deserve it, they never get it. Am I right? You do it because they need it. I receive mercy because I needed mercy. I needed God's grace. I needed God not to give me what I deserve, but what I need. And he gave it to me. And when that son came home, that younger boy came home, he gave his son what his son needed. And he did need the lecture. He did need clean yourself up. He did need, what have you done? Are you done? And all the rest of it. His son needed to be loved and welcomed. And he needed a father. And his father gave himself to that son. And then the resentful son, the father turns around and he gives himself to him too. Because he realized that the elder brother and his big attitude and all that also needed mercy, undeserved. I don't know if I'd have told that older boy, I'd say, well, why don't you take off? I don't know. But he recognized this, that older son, the slave, needed a father's love too. And he gave it to him. Um, you know, I'm reminded of one story. I'm reminded of many stories. The thief on the cross, when we think about people that have done whatever and then they they come home, and those of us that have been walking in this for a long time, the thief on the cross, remember him? He was a mess. He didn't have a chance to make anything right. He didn't get to fix what he had done. All he had was a moment to turn to Jesus. Remember me. When you come into your kingdom, and the craziest, it got it done. It, it, it was enough. Remember me, those, remember me. It wasn't just the magical words. It worked because he asked the right person to remember him. But you get it? He couldn't fix his life up. He couldn't get it together. He couldn't clean it, himself up. And he was in. He didn't have time to pray the prayer. He was totally reliant on one thing, and so are we, mercy. Mercy of God. The story of the Pharisee and the, and the tax collector. Pharisee stands up, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, look at me. And then he pointed to this little tax collector how messed up he was. I'm not like him. And all that tax collector could do in that moment. Think of it, the Pharisees, I've done this and that, and I'm so much better than you. And all the tax collector, known as the publican in the old version, said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's all he had. No, no games. I, no, I'll do this. I'd say, I'll do this. The house of Zacchaeus. No, it's like, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's what happened with the, the younger boy that came, that came home. We are totally reliant on the mercy of God and we need to somehow rejoice when we see the mercy of God in action, even when it's not toward us in that moment. Can we rejoice when we see the mercy of God 
being poured out on someone like the thief at the cross. Not long after I was a Christian, <clears throat> my stepdad, if you were there the first week, he used to beat my mom. That terrible fights and police and all the rest of it. And I, want, I remember one time I was 10 years old. I remember the moment because I finally had enough courage that they were going at it and, and I jumped on him. Literally, I'm a 10-year-old and I'm just, I just jumped him. And he picked me up and he threw me down on the floor. And then my mom went into a rage. She went for the butcher knife and we went from there with other things. And I vowed, one day I'm going to get you. One day I'm going to be big enough and strong enough. You're not going to do this again. And it was in college, just a year or two after I was a Christian, I thought I was clean and it was all done. And there was another situation that emerged and I was heading to, I was heading to deal with him. And I got intercepted by, by a real good friend that calmed me down. And I thought, how could I feel this way? I love Jesus, I mean, but this anger was just, it was just down there all this time. I'm telling you all this to say it was, I don't know, maybe a year or two later that he was sick and in the hospital. And I went to pray for my stepdad, Bob, and I led him to Christ. And it wasn't long after that I did his funeral. Might have been the first one or the first or second one. And by the, the time, by the end, I loved him. And God asked me to give him the same mercy that had been given to me. That was one of the turning points in my life. It was obviously good for him, but it was the last me. He didn't change his life. It was right before he died. It was like the thief on the cross. And I know I want to see him in heaven. I don't know what we're going to talk about because we didn't really know each other. But I'm going to see him in heaven. Because I didn't allow hate to get in the way of mercy. Are you with me? And it was in that moment with my stepdad and then the funeral, that was my freedom moving forward. Are you with me? Mercy is our friend. Mercy received and mercy given is our friend. Sometimes it's easy to get offended by God's mercy and generosity. And what do we do when that happens? I have an idea. We repent. We repent. And repentant means turn around and go a different direction. I'm not going to do that. I repent of my attitude. The elder brother, his step was to repent and go into the party. Mercy is getting what we need, not what we deserve. And here's one last thought as we, before we pray. I think it really is going to be my last thought. I love you guys. Thanks for letting me go this deep and share these things with you. Because I think God is, I think he's creating a people a father's house to prepare for an outpouring of his spirit and a, and a homecoming beyond belief and measure. But we have to deal with maybe some of our own elder brother syndrome things that, that come in. But I wonder about something. Everybody talks about spiritual maturity, knowing the Bible, reading your Bible, prayer and those things. Those are all good disciplines. But I wonder one major, if one major sign of spiritual maturity and spiritual growth is our ability to rejoice in the success and blessings of others who gets more than us. I think that's a growing up time. When you have a need and you, and you want and need whatever, and somebody else gets something more than what is given to you, when you can rejoice in that, I think we're moving forward. And, and for us, I would add, when we can rejoice in the success of other churches, 
And there are a number of other churches that were in our, our city in Fort Collins that we would rejoice in their growth and their, and when, and their blessing. And sometimes they were getting blessed way beyond us. Can I rejoice in that? Will I rejoice in that? Will we rejoice what God is doing over our city within the body of Christ? Or is it, what about us? What about me and all this rest of it? God will take care of you and me. And he will take care of us. Would you stand with me? Father, Lord, I for one want to say I'm sorry when I have not rejoiced in what others have and compare them to me and what I have. And Lord, I ask you to forgive us and I ask you to cleanse us from any remnant of that elder brother syndrome where we see ourselves morally above, better than, more worthy than, or whatever than. God, I ask you to forgive us. Forgive me, God. Forgive your church, God but we rejoice in what we have. Whether, whether we're the runaway son and daughter or whether we're the son or daughter that's never gone far, but we're distant in our hearts and with our own bitterness and judgments. God, forgive us and free us, Lord. Free us, God. In the name of Jesus, break that off of us, Lord. And teach us to love mercy. Not just to show it, because we have to and we should. Papa God, would you help us to love it? That we would love mercy like you love mercy. And we would love grace and not be afraid of it. And we'd be reminded that it's, it's the kindness of God that has led us here. Not your judgment, not your criticism, it's your kindness, it's your love in spite of everything and anything is why we're here. Lord, help us respond to others, even in our family, even people close to us like my stepdad. Help us respond to others like you do. And by the way, my friends, just the only way we can do that is if you let God love you and you let down your guard. Give us your heart, God, for those that are far away from you and struggling and broken and don't know how to get home, and don't know what to do, and are addicted beyond measure. God, give us your heart for them too. Not only our sons and daughters and friends and family, but for those in our community and around us at work and all the rest of it, God. Lord, thank you for your love, acceptance, and forgiveness that, that we have received undeservedly from you, God, but we have it. I pray in Jesus' name, God, that you would help us to extend that love, acceptance, and forgiveness. And Lord, I ask that you would make Arise Vineyard Church a father's house for people to come home to. A healing community a place of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Let's worship as we close. Come Holy Spirit. Just receive now. Spirit of the living God, come into this place, Lord, and do what only you can do, God. Come, Lord. Come, Lord.